Open your Bibles up tonight, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. How many of you tonight still have your little black card that was in? Do anybody have it that's in your Bible? Anybody at all have that? If you have that and you keep that, you'll know as we kind of march through these things, we've laid it out. And uh, just as we've seen this morning, uh, God sometimes will take us a different path. And uh, I believe in uh, preaching what the Lord puts on our heart. And uh, you and I know that we have to be obedient to that. And uh, God obviously knows better than what we do. And uh, But as we come tonight, uh, this morning we talked about ministry. Of course, under Understanding. What does it mean to be able to work together, to labor together? Well, we were able to be able to see briefly, vaguely, if I can say it that way, what it really meant by laboring together in ministry. You know, we work with so many different teams and so many different people, and we wonder how in the world people make it the way they make it. Well, it takes a oneness in mind. When people are on the same page, they can do a lot for the glory of God. I've seen few people do a, a lot more than a, a great multitude of people simply because they were all in one accord. If you're with me tonight, say amen. And that's what we need. We need people of one accord to be able to have one mind, one mind, to be able to be focused on the things that God would have us to be able to do. Not your agenda, not my agenda, not separating on things that are petty things, but rather just uh, submitting to God and walking together and seeing the glorious gospel the Lord Jesus Christ shared in whatever way we need to be able to do it. And what a privilege it is that we get to do that. Now, I say that for this reason, because there's a strong, strong need that we understand, as Paul said, as I mentioned to you this morning, that we're not as babes. We need to be able to make this a year that we, if I can say it this way, we grow up. I mean, we understand what the Bible not just commands of us, but what we should be as a local church, that we understand what God has called us to be as a local church. And I just want to say again that I'm thankful for the local church. I'm thankful for Haynes Baptist Church. And I'm thankful for what God has done in my life and through my life. But it's time that we get beyond the things that have made us stumble that has made us be distracted. And we look beyond that, realize that God is in control and we trust Him. And the only thing we got to do is one thing, not fix our problems and not change things and not control things. But the one thing we got to do is do what He said and not simply be faithful. And if we'll be faithful to God, thank God God will be faithful to us. Amen? But that's the hardest thing. Tonight we come to something that seems to be irrelevant. But if we're talking about growth and we're thinking about this year, we're thinking about how God has blessed us, this is something that's not much time preached on, but it's something that is needful. And you cannot say that you're growing and growing in one area and not growing every area. Let me, let me make this plain to you. You know, if, I, if I'm growing, and y'all kind of give me your, 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 your imagination for a moment, you know, uh, Brother Travis, I'm not going to have my legs grow and then my arms not grow. Can I get an Amen. Can I get an amen? It, you understand? I mean, you know, we, we act like in our Christian life, you know, uh, uh, everything's going to grow, but we got like one part that don't grow. So we got like one half of a leg and the other leg don't grow. No, uh, the Lord himself, as we continue to be able to be yielded to the Spirit of God, we grow in all areas of our life because when he opens up our eyes, a submitted heart is always willing to do whatever God calls and commands us to do. When you come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, we pick up to where Paul is now speaking and as he talks, he is using Macedonia as an illustration as he deals with Corinth. And it's about the subject of really giving and a generous giving, or maybe I should say it this way, a generous living. And I want to ask you this question before we dive into it tonight. Are you living with a generous living? If somebody looks at your life, do they see generosity? And I'm not just talking about your giving financially, but do they see you have a willing spirit to, to be able to help, to be able to serve, to be able to jump in, to be able to sacrifice? Do they see you withholding things? Or when they see you, do they see you truly giving everything you have for the glory of God because you understand God did not bless you for you to be blessed? God did not save you just for you to be saved. He, he saved us so that we might do, as the Bible says, to be able to share the gospel, to be able to preach the gospel all over this world. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish. And all God's people said, amen and amen. So we understand there is a purpose for us, but there's also a purpose for everything that God gives. And whether it be our family, whether it be our children, whether it be our abilities, whether it be our talents, whether it be our spiritual gifts, whether it be our finances, whatever it is, there is a responsibility that we have because this is God's way. 
And if we want God to bless Haynes Baptist Church, we must continue to function the way that God tells for us to be able to function. So when you come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, let me just read just a few verses tonight if I can. And we'll start in verse number 1. The Bible says this. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded uh, under riches of their liberty, li uh, liberality. The Bible says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this they did. Not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had began, uh, uh, so uh, he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, uh, in all, uh, uh, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in the grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the for, uh, for, uh, uh, forwardness uh, to, of others. And to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, you, you might want to put it in there, or my sake, you might underline and put not just your, but my sake also. For my sake, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. If you're thankful for that tonight, say amen. You come to this text, we're obviously thinking about the poverty that's going on. And matter of fact, as you continue to study, they're, they're thinking about different areas just of the world. Matter of fact, uh, Macedonia and, and, and Corinth was a lot more blessed than Jerusalem was. So Paul comes to them and he's beginning to address a need that uh, there was a, a, an issue of poverty that was in Jerusalem. So therefore, he begins to speak to them. This is almost pretty much, as far as, as, far as my knowledge, this is the first act that you could think of this way of, of the first generation of Christians that when they were known to be Christians. This was the first thing that they had that they could really do together. They had the privilege at this moment right here to be able to come together and be a blessing to somebody else. So Paul was sent to be able to speak to them and he spoke to them about their generous living. Now I want to tell you tonight, if you want to know your spiritual growth, if you want to know your spiritual appetite, if you want to know how in tune you are and how serious you are about growing closer to God, you probably right now can examine yourself on what you think about the quote-unquote topic of this portion of Scripture. Because a lot of times when we get thinking about generous living, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. It don't really matter to us. It goes in one ear and out the other. And watch me. And then we wonder why in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December, there are struggles and there are battles. And we think, well, I've been growing into the Lord. No, what you mean is this. You've been going to church and you've been singing in the choir and you've been serving in the ministry. And maybe, yes, you have been praying and you might have been talking to brothers and sisters in Christ and you've been doing some different things, but you can't choose to serve God in one way and not choose to serve God in every way that the Bible says. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. And all God's people said, amen. We understand this. So he says, you and I need to know that this is important when it comes to the child of God. And may we run well. Yes, God has blessed our church, but you know this as well as I have. I know that God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing. God has done something in us so we can do more for His honor and His glory. And I encourage you right now to examine your heart, to examine your blessings, to examine what God has given you in your life. So now we talk. I want you to notice a few things about this generosity tonight. Number one, the manifestation of generosity. What do you mean by that, Brother Jason? What I mean by that is if you go back to verse number one, what you're going to see is this is the things that we've seen. As he talked to uh, the church of Corinth, he was telling them by example about Macedonia. And he said, I just want you to be able to know because they were so generous, 
I want you to know the things that they actually experience. Notice, if you will, in verse number 1, what the Bible says. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. So the first thing that we notice when we look at Macedonia is this, is they experience the, God, the grace of God. If you need the grace of God in your life, say amen. So if you want the grace of God in your life, this is what he's saying, by testimony, by example. The reason why Macedonia had seen so much of the grace of God is because they were generous in their living. They were generous in the way that they gave. They did not hold back. They gave God absolutely everything that they were willing to be able to do and have because they knew that God's grace was sufficient. And if they were going to be able to give, they were going to have to give by grace because that's how God taught them and God proved things through their life. When we think about grace, grace is something that actually empowers us to be able to serve. If you want to be able to serve, sometimes it's not always easy to be able to serve some people, but by grace you can serve people because God is able to be able to help you do that. Not only that, sometimes grace enables us to forgive. It's not always easy to forgive. There's some of you tonight that's got some things in your life and you've got some people in your life, you're thinking to yourself, they don't deserve forgiveness. And you're right. They may not deserve forgiveness. But at the end of the day, because of the grace that God has put in your life, it will enable you to be able to forgive and let people know that it's all right, that their wrong was not unto you. It might have been unto somebody else or unto the Lord, but you just seem to be the victim. But because, as the Bible says, as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you, you too shall forgive them. People say, how could she forgive them? How can he forgive them? I'll tell you how. It's a work of grace. Somebody help me tonight. It's a work of grace. Grace also grants us the strength to be able to get through difficulties. I think we could go around the church tonight. We could talk. And one by one, by one people could stand up and testify about this very principle. So many times we deal with different things. We have difficulties and we wonder, how does so-and-so get through it? How can that senior saint be able to have such joy? And how can they continue to serve the Lord and sing in the choir and lift up holy hands? How in the world can they be like that? I'll tell you how they do it. It's simply because of grace. Grace helps us with these things, but grace also is able to be able to give us a generous spirit. It will change you. You might be somebody that's dogmatic. You may be critical. Uh, you may be somebody that, if I can say it this way, you're a hoarder. You're about yourself. You don't want to do for nobody else. Hey, but when you realize where God brought you from and you realize how bad you could be and how much money you wasted in this world before you ever got saved and born again, you're thinking, if I could waste this money on this world, surely the best thing I could do is invest it in God. Even if I ain't got it, God gave it to me. And if God gave it to me, I'm going to give it back to God. And when you give to somebody, and when you give to the church, you're not given to that person. You're not given to the church. You are given to God himself. You say, how does somebody do that? It's a work of grace. That's what it is. And he says, when you want to know about this, it's seen in the way that they give. And you're seeing it because of the grace that's in their life. But notice, if you will, beyond that, verse number two, the Bible says this. The Bible says this, verse number two, it says, and how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound in the riches of their liberal, uh, liberal, liberal, uh, liberal, liberality, whatever it may be. And somebody says, amen. Amen. I sound like a Parkland graduate. Hallelujah. Anyhow, nonetheless, you see, secondly, not only they experience God's grace, but you notice this, it, ex it helped extend them over difficulty. Did you notice what the Word of God says? The Bible says that they were in a trial. Notice it. It's, it's plain. They were in a great trial of affliction. They were in a great trial of affliction. But then beyond that, they found joy. The Bible says they were in a place of poverty. And then they were able to be able to give abundant, be able to give more simply because everything they dealt with, it did not determine how much they give. In other words, what God just teaches us is this. It don't matter how hard your circumstances are, God will still bless you and give you the grace the way that you're supposed to give. You ought to be obedient to give that way no matter what your circumstances are. 
Circumstances don't bless you. They don't put food on your table. They don't put money in your bank account. It's God who does that. And the wind may blow and the creek may rise and the storms may come. But at the end of the day, God is still faithful. Your whole house might be wiped out. But you know what's going to happen? God's going to provide for you to have another house. God's going to put food back on your table. God's going to give you new clothes. Why? Because it's the grace of God. And when you begin to have this spirit, this, this generous living that's in your life, you begin to see things like this and nothing determines that changes you in any other way not only that but also this it enlarges your ability it enlarges your ability notice if you will when you see this generosity come to service Bible says verse number three notice it says for to their power I bear a bear record yea and beyond their power they were willing of themselves did you notice the words beyond their power power in other words Words, it was more than what they had. Uh, it, it was more than, than, than what they could do. It was more than, than what they could actually come up with. They, they had a, a, a mindset to be able to say, no, it, it's, not about, it's not about just this little bit that I have, I'll give that. No, they were able to be able to give more because of the generosity that was in their heart. And it was the work of grace that God had done this great work on them. You know, it's funny because so many times we talk to these young people that's in here tonight, and you need to listen when I say this, and because it's my generation and many others that struggle with this, we always say things like this about my generation and down. They live outside of their means. They live outside of their means. They, they go out to eat and they live outside of their means. They drive a car and they live outside of their means. They buy a house and they're living outside of their means. But have we ever heard anybody say this? They're giving outside of their means. I'm going to tell you something. You want to make a difference in somebody's life? You give to God. You let people see how good God's been to you. And you give way beyond, way beyond. I'm telling you, whatever God puts on your heart, you give beyond what people think. You say, well, I know what God expects. He expects a tithe. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to say to you tonight, when you come to giving to God a tithe, listen, that's just what God asks of you. That's what God tells you to be able to give. But to be able to go beyond that is something completely different. And tonight, if you want to be able to experience the blessings of God and be able to know just how good God is, you just need to make up your mind. I'm not just going to live within my means. I'm going to give beyond my means. I'm going to be able to do everything that I can for the glory of God and you got to make your mind up to be able to do so but the fourth thing that you see in this the way that the generosity was manifest what it manifested was this is they eagerly gave they eagerly gave notice what the Bible says in verse number four the Bible says this it says they were able the latter part of verse number three they were willing of themselves praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the give and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. So here they were willing to be able to give. The Bible says in verse number 3, they were willing to be able to give. They had a willingness to be able to do so. They were eager. That's what that, that word, the entreaty. They were eager to be able to, to give to Paul. They wanted to bless Paul. They were vocal about this to Paul. They said, Paul, we want to be a blessing to you. We want to be able to encourage you. We want to do these things. And this is when you see generous living really in somebody his life. I never forget when I first got saved that uh, I've shared this before that you know I've not always understood and, and still probably don't know everything about giving and about the Bible. I'm learning all the time. But I'll never forget when we came to church, man, people passed the plate and never knew anything about it. And people's putting money, they's putting check, they's putting envelopes and different stuff in there. And I thought, well, somebody that's just what they give, that's what they do. But watch me now, before I ever understood, and to God be the glory, I'm just saying this, before I ever understood any of that stuff. I'll never forget when I'd pull off there, a Silas Creek Parkway, and I would come up on Stratford Road. Uh, there used to be to the right there a, a Chevy places around the corner, and you turn left, and you go to the old Haynes Town. And there used to be a man that would sit there, and he'd walk up, and uh, he'd get off his stool, and he was selling papers. Man, I'd get up there, and because I was born again, I had something in my heart to be a blessing to him. I realized how much money I used to wait in the midnight hours and, and, and waste in the midnight hours and, and waste on other things. And I'd pull up to get a paper, and during that time, I don't know, a paper might have been a dollar, $1, dollar twenty-five, or something like that. I mean, I just reached out and grabbed a twenty, and I thought I was doing something good, amen. And at the end of the day, I was. And I promise you, every time he seen my car pull up, praise God, he would limp over there and he'd give me my paper first before anybody else, amen. That's the way it worked. But here's why. Grace does something to your heart. 
Grace does something and it moves you that when you see somebody with a need and you see somebody that's not as blessed as you, and we come to church and we see things like we did in the missions conference and it's not just people that are sitting here in our backyard in a parkland at a rescue mission, but also across this country and across this globe, it does something in you. And because of that, there's a, a generous living that's in you. And as we work together, as we labor together, as we strive together, let us never lose focus of what really matters. Because you know what the devil would love to do? He'd love to split this church down the middle, have one half begin to be concerned about the longevity of the church. They're trying to take care of the church. They're trying to be able to put everything in order. They're trying to make sure the church don't get tore up. And I think we could all agree tonight those things matter. Can I get an amen? But then you've got another side of the church. They may think, well, you know, we need to be able to give the missions. We need to be able to keep our mind focused on missions. So now what happened is both of them have good intentions. You understand somebody's trying to take care of the house of God. God, I don't, I don't look down on them. I thank God for people like that. I think we should take care of the house of God. Amen. But things need to stay in order. And the Bible says, as you read it up there, it says, with one mind striving together for what? For the betterment of the building? No. For the bigger, or for the, for the growth of the building? No. For the growth of the church? No. For the faith of the gospel. That's what matters. So the faith of the gospel is the number one thing. So everything we do, it falls in line. It helps us. It becomes to be a launching pad for us to do more for the glory of God. And yes, it's okay to be able to take care of the building. Yes, it's okay to be able to do those things. And we should because people can come to church. They can hear the gospel. You don't have to pray during service that the facilities get taken care of. Can I get a witness right there, right? I mean, you understand those things happen. It matters. But this is why you must do this because if you don't do this, it begins to wrap people and it changes them. And you just cannot do that. You have to be able to have a mindset. I want to be able to give. I want to be able to do this. Notice, if you will, go over to chapter number 9, just on the same page, probably, or one page over. Would you notice what he says in verse number 7? We read this all the time. The Bible says, every man. Everybody say, every man. Say, every man. I, I don't believe there's any filler words in the Bible. I, I don't think it's there by accident. I don't think it's there for leadership. I don't think it's there for deacons, Sunday school teachers, people to sing on the platform, people to sit on the pew, shake hands. The Bible says every man, and that's not male as in the gender male. No, that's every man as in man, woman, boy, and girl. Every man, notice what the scripture says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So what he's saying is, is, if you want to be able to see these things, man, when people get excited about giving, I just want to go on record and say this. We seen this in 2023. Somebody help me now. We seen it. We're not preaching to fix things. I think we could all do better. I think collectively we could do better. I think there's people that don't understand, and just because they don't understand, I'm not browbeating. It's gonna it's a work of grace to help you understand giving. It's a work of grace to help you understand tithing. Some of you could debate and say, no, that's what the Bible says. I understand all of that, okay? But the Lord has been long-suffering with you and I about a lot of things. And thank God, he'll be long-suffering with a lot of other people. And there's some people, they don't have as much as others. And they are living off of, if I could say this way, ends meet, right? They're, they're trying to be able to do the best that they can do with what they have. And they're trying to understand. They don't even know how they're going to be able to pay their water bill. And it's the cheapest bill that they have. And I'm not being uh, sarcastic. I mean, people really struggle with these things. There are people in our church you and your family may have insurance there's people in our church they're praying they never get sick because they don't have insurance so I am not knocking that but you need to understand it's a work of grace y'all help me now it's a work of grace and the more that we live and the more that we testify let me tell you what God did for me let me tell you how God met our need I never forget a couple years ago when Miss Terry stood up and she said that she had made a faith promise and I think it was somewhere between seven and nine hundred dollars something like that and and uh, she began to testify about how the Lord met the need and she had stopped working her job and she knew what God put on her heart. She knew what the Lord had put on her heart. 
Lo and behold, it was just a few months later, I guess maybe about September or October or so, she says she got a phone call or there was some kind of communication that came to her. And she says uh, there was an account that she had. And she did not know anything about it, but they said literally she had money. They sent her to check. You know how much it was? Am I telling it right? It was for the same amount that God said that he would provide. How many? Two weeks after. Somebody say amen. And what I'm trying to say to you is out of obedience, God met that need. So if God puts something on your heart, listen, when we do these little, we do these little cards, we don't do these cards to be able to say, well, this is what you give. No, you pray what God wants you to do. That's what matters. You pray what God wants you to do. Because when you do that, God will meet that need. He'll tell you what to do, and then God will meet that need. He's going to give you what you need. Y'all with me? Say amen. He said, you don't believe that? I do believe that. I'm not a heavenly father, but I'm an earthly father. Uh, my son the other day, many of you know that I've been trying to teach him about finances. He didn't want to listen to me. He wasn't keeping his bank account. He went to McDonald's. I've already told the Wednesday night crowd. He went up there, and he was over there with a, um, I'll say this in a nice way, because this way he's a, he was eating with a, um, a, a girl who was a friend. Everybody all right, amen. I want to be very clear when I say that. And um, anyhow, they get up there, and, you know, he decides he's going to go, and he sits down, and he's a McDonald's. Everybody loves McDonald's fries, and he gets his fries, and he's sitting there, and he begins to do that card, and all of a sudden, fries, French fries. I mean, I know it's not a dollar, but it used to be on a dollar menu, right? I, I know no such thing as a dollar menu. So it might be like a dollar fifty-seven, maybe two dollars. His card's declined. All of a sudden, he puts his car back down. He comes home, and he's like, how much money do I get in the bank? Or how much money do I have in the bank? And I'm like, you don't have no money in the bank. He said, yeah, I know, because it declined. I couldn't even eat. So my, his mama is about to leave me because she thinks I shamed our son in Pearl Buck Because how could you let him go without French fries? I think he had to learn. He had to learn. And then all of a sudden, he's playing catch up. He's trying to be able to get things done. Before you know it, he's running up and down the road. And listen, and I'm proud of him, just like our kids. We've got a lot of kids. He's working a job, and he's doing the schoolwork, and he's playing ball, and he's studying, and he's struggling. He's doing everything he can. I'm very proud of him. But he's trying to run back and forth and back and forth. And uh, the other day, he comes up there and, and showed him how to be able to use that machine. By the way, you know, we have a machine out there. You might not carry checks or cash or anything like that, but we have ways to be able to give. And uh, he goes out there, and he swipes that card, and he begins to learn how to be able to do it. And I listen, to God be the glory, I'm just saying he's not in here, okay? Well, last week he, he gets a little low, Brother Randy, and he can't make it. But I know he just paid X amount of dollars to be able to pay his tithe. Well, you know what Daddy did? Daddy did what daddies do. Amen, Gabe, you do the same thing. You slide a little money over there and say it's going to be all right. Daddy's going to take care of you. Can I get amen? Can I get amen? Y'all girls don't look at me like I'm crazy. I know y'all know what I'm talking about, right? When I say this, how much more does our Heavenly Father love us? know what I love my son you know and, and I didn't tell him he don't know and by the way I didn't tell Tiffany you need to get right with God don't be bitter at me no more amen and, uh, I'm serious though and, and, and that's what happens you just got to teach it. it's a heart we got to testify this matters so let's go to this not only do you see the manifestation of generosity but quickly tonight you, you see the motivation the motivation of it notice when you get to the latter part let's go on down in verse number five let's just start there the Bible says this the Bible says in verse number five and this they did not as we hope but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God so what is the motivation what is it that motivates them first of all they had a surrendered heart. Uh, they were willing to be able to give what they had because they had already surrendered their life. I mean, it wasn't even a question. It, it made no difference. It was an act of the will. It wasn't what they felt. It wasn't an option. It wasn't multiple choice. It wasn't if it made sense. It wasn't if it looked good in a bank account. No. They had already surrendered everything. And when you surrender your life, when you surrender your plans, when you surrender your future, when you surrender your heart, when you surrender your priorities, when you surrender everything to God, then it's not going to be a question whether or not you will give God what God asks for you to be able to give. So you got to surrender your heart. This is your motivation. And because of that, you will always do what's right. Not only that, but also you'll grow spiritually. This is the very thing that will make you give. This is your motivation. As you continue to grow, as you grow, you will want to give. You'll learn more about giving and things will change. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 7. He says this. He says, therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. So here they are. They're growing. They are abounding. They're abounding. 
economy. They're growing in faith. They're growing in knowledge. They're growing in diligence, in love. They're growing in their giving. They're learning these things. And you remember what I said earlier? That's what matters, that you learn, that you grow. And as you grow, you're not just going to love more. As you grow, you're, you're not just going to pray more. No, as you go, you are going to be able to give more. You're going to serve more. You're going to be well balanced. And we're going to see that. Now, I will say this. It's going to be harder for you, okay? And that's the key. Because to live by faith, it, it affects you when it begins to touch you. But I'll say this, and you hear me well. It will bless you. It will bless you. It will do something for you. And I promise you this. When you do that, you may do it anonymous. And God will reward you. But I'll say this. You may do it to a place to where somebody knows that you did it. And you didn't do it in the church. You didn't do it through the church. You just did it. You hear me what I'm about to say. It'll change your life because that person that you were a blessing to will never forget the way that you sacrificed to be a blessing to them. Am I telling it right? Say amen. It, it, they will never forget. So you will grow. It will show you the importance. Now you say this tithing matter. I, I'll never forget when I first got saved. There are so many questions. I, I've heard a lot of good men say a lot of different things. And I just want to go on record and say I'm not a Bible scholar. I, I don't know everything. I know why I believe what I believe. And I know why I stand where I stand. Some people don't believe that the tithe exists anymore. They believe that you give based on grace. And I just want to be able to say this. If that's the case, then you better keep on giving because you can't outgive grace. Amen. Thank God you're in our church. Praise the Lord. If you haven't joined, we'd love for you to be able to join, and we'll give you some envelopes. And all God's people said, y'all smile. I'm kidding, but I'm being serious, all right? But some people say, well, it's Old Testament. Oh, I'll never forget I went back when then I found out that the tithing, it, it happened long before, before tithing was ever done in the Old Testament law. In Genesis chapter number 14, 20, tithing was before the law. So to be able to say that tithing was extinguished when the law was extinguished because now we live by grace, then you explain to me why tithing mattered before the law, but it extinguished with the law. That don't make no sense. Tithing was also practiced when it was in the Jewish worship in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter number 12. And then it's validated when you come to Jesus when he's speaking to the Pharisees in Luke chapter number 11 verse number 42 he speaks to them he says these all ye have done he said these are things you should have done you should tithe you should be able to give these are things that matter tithing matters and it is a biblical principle now three things and I wrote these down I, I got them out of my notes from years ago three things that's truths about tithes I'll share this with you and move on number one when you tithe it keeps the Lord as your first priority Matthew 6 33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God. When you tithe, it shows that he's your first priority. Somebody help me tonight. It shows he's first. Now, in my opinion, it might not show the church, because I don't believe it's the church's business, but it'll show the Lord that he's your first priority. The second thing tithing does is it reminds you on a daily basis, or at least a weekly or monthly basis, that everything you have comes from God. That's what the Bible says in James chapter number 1, verse number 17. Everything you have, it comes from God. Can I get an amen? It reminds you, you know that you are a steward of these things. The third thing is this, is when you give, it also shows, it shows that you literally have a desire to be able to be blessed, and it shows your position for God's blessing in your life. And the Bible speaks of this in the book of Malachi, chapter number Number three in verse number 10 and he talks about how God will bless you and God will take care of you if that's the case of what's in your life he says this let me read it to you he says bring bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may uh, be meat in my house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts and I will not open the uh, open uh, I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a ble and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it so God says if you'll come I'll prove it that I will bless you I will do more for you than you could ever imagine if you will just be obedient by a work of grace hello think about that to be a generous giver somebody say amen so God's just saying hey I'm blessing you to do this I'm equipping you to do this I'm going to help you to be able to do this but you're doing it because I've done a work in your heart so you're getting a double blessing and all God's people said amen right not only that too but it's also something that when you begin to be a generous giver and you live with generosity the motivation is because you actually love and it's a sincere love Notice what the Bible says in verse number 8, if you will. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness, forwardness to prove the sincerity of your love. You know what happens is when you give, it proves that you love God as much as you say you do. I give you this and I move on. You give because you're following the example of Christ. 
If you have no other reason, that's the, all, that's, that's, that's the only reason you need to be able to give. You say you love Jesus. You say that he's your hero. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 9. The Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that, he, that ye through his poverty might be rich. God gave so that you and I could receive. Sweetest verse we've ever heard or quoted. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let me ask you something. What have you given back to God? What have you given? You know, we look at these people, and I'm going to tell you again, I say this for the record. I'm thankful for Haynes Baptist. You might not realize this, but we came through last year and we got to the latter part of the month, so we always do our Thanksgiving boxes. And man, God met the need. I remember talking to Miss Angie, and before you know it, she began to count, and she's sitting there thinking, and it's kind of like we're counting these pennies and pennies and pennies and pennies. I'll never forget the communication when she came. She says, well, I, from everything I know, God's already took care of everything. And it's a surprise because we're thinking, I don't know how this is going to work. You say, why does it matter? Because it's not about the turkey. It's not about the newscast that's sitting outside. It's not about the people that post it on Facebook and want to, but want to celebrate. Though, though, though to God be the glory for it. It's about when we see those people walk in the door, God gives us the eyes and the, and the heart to be able to see them the way he's seen us. And when they come, we don't want to be empty-handed. We want to be able to sacrifice and be able to give to them so that they can ultimately see Jesus because it's not about them seeing Haynes Baptist Church. It's about them seeing the Lord. Can y'all help me tonight when I say that? Beyond that, it went beyond that, that we had someone anonymously donate. Uh, there was almost uh, between, well, really $5,000 that was given for many Christmas needs. And over the years, listen, I never, and many of you know that over the years, I've stood behind the pulpit and said, hey, there's a couple families. That we, and you know what? Y'all have always met the need. Hey, Y'all have always met the need. But you never heard me say it this year. You want to know why? Because before I ever even said it, you hear what I'm saying? Before I even even said it, somebody called and said, Jason, this is what the Lord's put on my heart. And you know what that says? That just says they just want to be like Christ. Let me give you the last thing and I'll be done if I have somebody come to the piano. The mobilization of generosity. The mobilization of generosity. In other words, so how, how can it happen? How does just general, how, Brother Jason, make sense of it? Well, first of all, anything you do by faith don't always make sense. You hear me? I'm preaching to myself. Everybody all right? Listen to me. Anything you do by faith don't always make sense. But I want you to notice, first of all, the reason you can give is because there's already an existing supply. Amen. You ever notice when you went to go give, you didn't think you had it, and then you gave it, you're like, man, it was there. Notice what the Bible says. I'll give you a Bible. The Bible says this in verse number 12. The Bible says this. It says, for if there, watch this now, for if there be first a willing mind. Everybody say willing mind. That's the key. If God sees your heart is what's supposed to be, your mind is made up. He said, if to be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. So we ain't talking about the tithe. We're talking about your giving. We're talking about your offering. And, and God says, I'm not asking you to give what you don't have. <laughs> Look up here. I'm asking you to give what I've already given you. And let that sink in for me. God's not asking you to give what you don't have. He's asking to give what he's already given you. When you got it, though, you thought, boy, I'd like to have a new pair of shoes. Boy, this sure would, this sure would fix them, them, them tires I need on my car. Or right, watch this now. And though it's good intentions, this would help me buy those Christmas presents for my baby. When at the end of the day, there's a lot of parents that buy Christmas presents, but they don't understand what a Christmas is all about. You listening to me? God says, I'm just asking you to give what I've already given you. Can I say this? I'm convicted when I read this. I realize, I, I, I realize how blessed my family is. 
I realize that. And God's been good to me. My struggles are a lot are my fault. You may be better than me. But everything that God puts on my heart. And you know what the greatest fear is? I'm going to finish in a minute. Listen to me. You and I may know, not know each other. But we'll all stand before God. And he's going to say, you remember when I told you to give that? We learned to shake it off. We walked on and we lived with it. But at the end of the day, when we stand before God, we're going to be reminded when we were not obedient. Not only is there existing supply, notice this, it's an equal sacrifice. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 13. For I mean not that the other men be eased and ye be burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there be and may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had, had no lack. And this is what God's saying. God's saying, I'm not, I'm not going to ever ask somebody that don't have anything to give more than what they have. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask somebody who has a lot to be able to give so much because it's what, no, it's going to be of equality. God's going to make sure that we are all taken care of. And though your money may not be the same figure as somebody else, he don't look on it based on your bank account. I'll be honest with you. Can I say this and be very truthful? There's some people in this church that have less than I do, but when offerings probably give more than I do. And God takes care of them. And you want to know why? Because they've learned to do without. Forgive me for being transparent tonight. When my son needs something, I usually take care of it. And I could say this. I, I, Tiff will tell you, I'm bad. We go with people. I'm usually trying to buy their meal. I'm try, I mean, I'm typically, I'm trying to... But there's some people that have truly given everything to God and they just said, you know what? It don't matter. God gave it to me. I'm not going to do without. God's going to take care of me. But here's the key. You listen to me. God's never going to expect something of somebody and something dealt different of somebody else. He knows how to take care of his children. So don't ever think it's unfair. Can I get an amen? Not only that, but let me give you this. There's also an eternal sufficiency and I'm done. Let me just pick up verse number 8. Read this if you will. The Bible says this. He said, chapter number 9, I'm sorry. Chapter number 9, verse number 8. We'll skip over. He says, and God is able to be able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So the first thing we see is this, is God provides the offering. He having all sufficiency for all things. Listen, the, the, the Lord's going to take care of these things. No matter what it is, if God puts it on our heart, he's going he's to meet the need. He's going to take care of it. But in notice verse number 11. This is where it really rubber meets the road. That when you do what you're supposed to do, watch us now, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, bountifulness which causes through us thanksgiving to God. He says, when you give the way you're supposed to give, you'll realize that God might not bless you. Listen to me, I'm done. He might not bless you financially. But you know that prayer you've been praying? He's about to answer it. You know that spouse you've been asking God to deal with their heart? He's about to touch their heart. You know that child that you've been praying that's been away from God? He can answer that prayer. You know that baby that you've been praying that God would give you? God will give you that baby. What God is saying is when you're faithful to be able to give to Him, He's able to be able to bless you in so many other ways. Your home would be better. Your ministry would be better. Your marriage would be better. Can I get a witness tonight? Your life would be better. 
You know why? Because giving is not something we do. It's a reflection of the heart. And when we begin to give sacrificially, we realize that every day we live, it's the Lord's day. Every battle that we face, it's the Lord's battle. I'm just in it for His honor and His glory. It changes our perspective because we realize this life that I live is not about a life of ease. This is about a life for His glory. So whatever God so chooses for my life, it's not about me. It's about Him. I say this in closing tonight. As you think about it tonight, maybe tonight the Lord will help you as you think about this year doing your part. Maybe God will bless you and you say, you know what, I, I want God to strengthen my faith through my giving. I want God to strengthen my faith through my generous living. Maybe you say this, I, I want to show, show that I love God more through my generous living. Maybe tonight that's your desire. I, I want the Lord to be able to know that I'm not just giving to be able to show and outdo somebody else, but I'm giving because I truly love the Lord. I'm not giving because the preacher says so. I'm not giving because the preacher preached on it. I'm not giving because he showed me chapter and verse. Watch me now. You ain't even got to know chapter and verse. If you love the Lord, you realize everything you have tonight, some of you would be dead and in hell if it was not for Jesus. So you don't need a chapter and verse. Some of you tonight love the Lord not just because you're saved, but because you've been down that path where you struggled and you were lonely and everybody gave up on you and some Christians gave up on you and some people that you thought were true friends gave up on you. But you hear me well, God just kept knocking. And because he never gave up on you, you love him tonight. Maybe tonight you make your mind up that you're going to have generous living because you want to be able to do more for the cause of Christ. Or maybe tonight, because of your children, those around you, you want to be able to do more and have generous living simply because you want to prove that God is still faithful. But hear me well. And I'm not saying this is why you give, but it is the Word of God. God says, if you will live with generous living, listen to me. God will bless you in ways that you don't understand. You might be the very one that's hindering your blessing tonight. Can I get a witness right there? She you stand your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Heaven. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart, and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God, and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today, and maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much, and we are definitely going to be praying for you and this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way and there's something heavy on your heart, Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much and may God bless you.